This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. When the love and inspiration of your very heart and soul overrides the fear of your mind, you will know peace. If you've been begging God for help and not getting a reply, there's a reason why. Through this simple yet dynamic process, you can build real physical evidence of how God can bail you out. In this book, you'll uncover why depression and anxiety are a normal part of spiritual evolution. The key spiritual faculty that allows you to be emotionally independent. How to stop the inertia of your life, tie up loose ends, and start over. How your current circumstances aren't proof of you failing in life. How to physically feel God. The methodology for effective prayer for real results. What to do when you spiritually evolve out of relationships and the mainstream. And more. If you're tired of being a victim of your own life, it's time to take control. Even if you don't know how anything is going to change, you can partner with the one who does. If you're low on faith and motivation, start here and upbuild your life from nothing. Valeria Telles interviews Rebecca Rockwood, the author of If I'm So Spiritual, Why Do I Feel So Crappy? How to Partner with the Divine to Upbuild Your Life from Nothing. Rebecca Rockwood is a certified spiritual counselor and spiritual teacher based in the Chicago area. Rebecca helps people to navigate the turbulence of spiritual evolution to overcome lifelong depression, anxiety, and spiritual disconnection. Meet Rebecca at RebeccaRockwood.com. Here's the interview with Rebecca Rockwood. In your own words, who is Rebecca Rockwood? Oh, who is Rebecca Rockwood? Oh, so you know what? I mean, I guess I am just Rebecca Rockwood who loves helping humanity and doing divine will for her life. And I think that is what everybody is really looking for, living an authentic life mm -hmm. and helping others. And I think really that's like, you know, what anyone's identity is. And when you can live it out every day, a real soulful, authentic life, mm -hmm. I mean, you're just living at your highest potential every day. And I think that's anybody's definition. How do we know when we are living this way, authentic and from the soul? Oh, you just feel it. You feel it. You're doing something you love. It feels um, 100% just in alignment with your spirit. And you know because you're you're happy and you feel alive every day. Um, and one of the things I do is I help people find what it is that they want to do with their lives. And a lot of times they're stuck and they don't know. Um, but once you begin the process of finding it and then doing it and like overcoming all of the fear that comes with it before you start, mm -hmm. um, you realize that there's really nothing you ever needed to be afraid of and that you had always been competent um, at doing the the love and the work that you're meant to do. Um, but really it was all just about um, getting over all the fear that you carried around forever. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> So do you believe that there is also room for all kinds of emotions, including the negative ones, even when we are living a soulful life? 
Oh, absolutely. Because everything sort of goes in cycles and seasons. You're not going to feel super invigorated all the time. Maybe you had a rough day. Maybe you're tired. I mean, it's really about being aware of how you feel, but also Mm -hmm. having something very handy. I call them a spiritual go-to. Some tool um, that isn't relying like on a person or anything like that, just maybe books or music or videos that you can watch that you can have easily accessible to pull you back up or to bring you down if you're feeling anxious, um, you know, but but having the will and the drive to actively apply them consistently so you can feel the results. Um, but no, you're not going to be riding high on the clouds all the time, um, you know, because you're always also going through like spiritual testing and strengthening and getting things up. Um, you know, to test the authenticity of new things and knowledge that you gain. Um, So you're going to have some dry seasons with those. Um, But you know you pass when you're tested again and and they don't affect you. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's all just a process. So it's about evolving, evolution. So it's an endless process in a way, isn't it? Oh, it is. It is because you're always evolving and that law of evolution never stops. In your book, you say something incredibly beautiful. When the love and inspiration of your very heart and soul overrides the fear of your mind, you will know peace. I love that. Oh, yeah. Um, Because most of the time people, like, for example, I I like to use meditation as an example, because a lot of times people can't just sit and meditate, um, you know, or they try too hard and they can't. Um, because they haven't yet trained the mind. They can't, you really have to whip it into shape first because any emotional reaction you have is always preceded with a thought. And that's why getting through to your mind first has to be done. Um, but really, yeah, it's about learning how to harmonize between the two and bringing them together so you can utilize your mind as a tool um, to transmit, um, a whole bunch of things to like humanity or yourself or to God and feeling it, the result with your heart. Um, so that's really what that means. And the more you can feel, the less you're thinking. Um, yeah. So you actually progress much farther and faster. Um, the more you feel, um, but, but yeah, a lot of times people struggle with that because their mind gets in the way. And then you a lot of times will just spiral down. But you just use your mind to spiral up is what I tell people because it takes the same amount of energy. Mm. Talk to me for a moment, Rebecca, about your spiritual journey. How did you come to these profound understandings about life and yourself? So it actually happened pretty quickly. I was a miserable sort of housewife. um, And I was, though, um, working on my spiritual counseling certification at the moment, too. And I had no idea what I wanted to do with that. I mean, you know, I have a master's degree in social work with a focus on mental health. I knew I didn't want to be a conventional therapist. Um, I didn't like how the system was set up and what I saw. But I had no idea. But what I did know was that I had no money and I had no personal like place to live. I really didn't have anything, but all I had was God. And Mm so, you know, um, I had to learn how to listen Mm -hmm. to the divine guidance and everything and to follow it because I had no other choice. I didn't have anyone else to help me. And that's really all it is. And that's all it boils down to. And so that's really how I do my work. God provided me in the span of five years um, enough money to pay off all of my student loans and to buy a house. And, um, you know, as long as you do your work, no matter how small your effort is, Mm -hmm. God has a a positive reward system that will just take you so far if you just put forth your effort and get your fear out of the way and just serve people and be of service. Um, In a nutshell, that is my spiritual journey. When you speak of God, I know you mentioned in your book that we might call this divine force give that the different names, but you call it God. So I will ask you this question. What, where, and who is God to you? Um, Honestly, it's 
it's almost like an energetic love yeah. if I could yeah because I can physically feel it and mm-hmm. I teach other people how to physically to how to physically feel it too and that's how you know what God is to the extent of which your vessel can be utilized for divine will um, that's how you know what God is and that's what I call like the God ratio or the God quotient mm-hmm. um, yeah so it's really just about doing you know making yourself available to the divine yeah when you say make yourself available that means doing something that it is good for you and others is that yeah you do what has to be done you you know it's a moment in life where you're tired of being sad you're tired of suffering you're tired of having a job you don't like you're you know you should move on from a relationship like there there's so much that you need to do which is where people get stuck but once you start doing it if just if you just trust that there is something there that's going to help you which people get so hung up because they can't feel it um but if you really just look around at the evidence of how you know the divine has not let you down before and once you really just look back and look at the evidence then you can start building a case for how god works in your life um and just take it one step at a time and that's all it is it's it's a constant you know um overcoming this fear doing this action and it gains momentum you gain more peace as things start to fall away from your life you get more connections you get more opportunities and then you learn that there's nothing you ever you know needed to be afraid of um and you wish you would have started 10 years ago <laughs> i wonder why so many people i have to say so many because there are a good number of people who don't believe in divine force and god anything like that i'm wondering how that happens rebecca how did they navigate this reality without any belief system in in a higher force and a divine force honestly i don't know but i'm willing to bet behind closed doors they're pretty miserable right so then <laughs> um, yeah right right yeah cuz they're not looking uh in the right place and i'm just willing to bet that there's just this void that they're trying to fill with other things and it's not quite working um but yeah you know you have to be ready to seek god um which is no like small task either um but yeah i mean i'm I, that's all i got to say I, i'm just willing to bet that behind closed doors they're miserable and they would probably never tell anybody either but they don't know what they're missing either you know so they don't know where to look another question i have for you is about the purpose of life what do you think that is and if we have chosen to be here in a human body. Oh, I absolutely think we do choose it. Um, but when we get here, we've kind of forgotten and we don't even know, you know. Um, and so when I work with people, especially ones who don't know what they want to do with their life, otherwise known as their life purpose, um i start assessing you know have you had any spiritual experiences have you ever seen anything have you ever felt anything you know i assess if they have experienced or felt or heard or whatever anything that is other than anything in the physical realm and that is how you get to the bottom of sort of what their spiritual gifts and abilities are because they're directly related to their life purpose um because you have to you know work with the divine to be able to um you know god takes care of the big stuff we can't control like connections and opportunities and like resources and stuff like that but we have to do the actions here on earth um you know to do what we're meant to do so you asked me about life purpose and i'm telling you it is work that you love to do that you're naturally gifted at that you could do all day it doesn't even feel like work and you love it and it's energizing and inspiring um but that can definitely be difficult to see um when it appears like your life doesn't validate any of those things and you have no idea what you want to do it's a painful process but it's a birthing process and once you start um it's really hard to stop so yeah <laughs> what would be the first step toward the understanding what our purpose is what would you say the first step would be pay attention to what inspires you mm-hmm. 
you have to pay attention to what inspires you, Um, whether it's a commercial or if it's a population that you're really drawn to, something that inspires you. But where people get hung up is, oh, this this inspires me, this thing. I want to go help these people. And then they get stuck on that. Well, how's that going to happen? I don't have A, B, or C. Um, And then they feel inadequate and they don't feel like they can do anything. Um, And then they let the inspiration go away. So the key is you have to keep the inspiration going after the initial spark is shown to you. Um, You know, and then a lot of it is divine trust that, the divine provides everything you need and a way to get there. You wrote, you might find yourself unintentionally getting sucked into comparing yourself. So talk to me about that and how comparison can get in the way in finding our purpose. So a lot of times, um, you know, we find the initial spark of inspiration, we'll call it. And you might look around to see who else is sort of doing that kind of work. Um, and then you're like, well, you know, maybe they're already doing that work. What, you know, what, what can I do that's anything different? Um, but what you're not realizing is that the work you start, it, it, it doesn't stay the same. It actually evolves into other things, which means um, you're going to wind up doing it in a different way that only you can do. Um, yeah. And, and so that's why it doesn't matter. And that's why when you start these, the, this process, always just focus on yourself um, and don't look at what you don't have and don't look at someone else and what they're doing. Um, You focus on yourself, you keep your inspiration there. And I like to tell people um, your service must outweigh your fear um, because you're going to get scared and it's going to happen. But when you think about the people who need you, this is no time to be like feeling weak or inadequate. This is a time to start learning. It's a time to get to work. Um, and you're going to love what you do. So don't be afraid. Um, but keep the inspiration going for sure. Yeah, I do have one more question for you, Rebecca. The warm up questions. Freedom. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? Uh, you know, I think it is being authentic and ultimately living the life that you've always dreamed. Um, yeah, always working toward the ideal life that you would have loved to live. I'm, I never, ever, um, thought in my whole life when I was a kid that I was ever going to leave my little hometown. Um, but here I am sitting in London and I've been here about two months. Um, you know, I, it's something I never would have thought, but also keep in mind, had I continued to have the mentality that I would never do something, I never would have been here, you know? Um, so when I hear someone say, I'm never going to do this, I'm never going to do that. You're right. You're never going to for as long as you think that way. Um, so you have to flip the switch at some point to go somewhere that you really want to go that you're going to love. So you wrote the book, if I am so spiritual, why do I feel so crappy? How, (laughs) I know I didn't want to say it that way, but well, you wrote it. How to partner with the divine to upbuild your life from nothing. So two initial questions. How did you become a writer and what was the main purpose of writing this book? Believe it or not, the first things I ever wrote were when I was a kid, I was writing on construction paper. And so one of the first things I like to ask people is, is there something you've always loved to do, even if you you know, haven't done it in a while? Because it's always a clue as to what your life purpose is. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was it. I just wanted to tell people that there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, and the universe has your back. Um, it takes some getting used to, it takes some recognizing it, it takes some validation, it takes some discernment, and it definitely takes some action that appears scary. But what you'll find is just that it's a process that leads you to greater things, um, to, to, to what you want, no less. Um, and so, yeah, this, and that's what this book is about. It is just the process and it's actually the process that I, um, tape people through in, in working with them. Um, and a lot of times they can open the book and see where they are in the process. Um, 
but it's just the process from fear to love and how to go through it. Um, you know, and, and that's really what it's just all about getting out of your fear and, you know, recognizing how to be of service to people. Because when you start thinking about people you want to help, that takes the pressure off of you. Um, yeah, that's really just what it's all about. I wonder a lot of times if we will come to place or a space of being fearless, having no fear. Do you believe that? Or we always will dance with fear somehow. No, I do. Um, to be really, really fearless all the way. Um, outside of temporary moments of discouragement or something like that. But, you know, it takes a great deal of spiritual diligence every day. Um, and that's really just the best way to combat it. Because it's the more you connect with the divine, the more fearless you're going to be. Because you're connected to something else. Yeah. 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 So... Talk to me about the how do we learn to distinguish, Rebecca, the voices? Sometimes, it, is that a practice for life? So it takes. So I find, at least in my work, that it's it can be different for different types of people, and it's based on what work you're meant to do in the world. Some people don't hear it so much of a, as a voice, although most people do. Um, and sometimes it's in like, it sounds like their own voice. So it can be different, difficult to distinguish between that and like their mind. Um, but it takes a level of practice to be able to discern, you know, what is your mind and what is, you know, the divine coming through. Um, but some people feel it as a physical feeling. Um, you know, some people see things, um, you know, different people just have different ways of just of of gathering that information, but it's direct, directly related to the to your divine purpose on earth. So definitely make sure to pay attention. But you know, cultivating that spiritual discernment does take time because a lot of times people don't believe it, they question it, and that completely like definitely hinders any more guidance from coming through. So. What is spiritual dryness? You, you do talk about that in the book, and why does it happen? Yep. Spiritual dryness. So when you start a solid spiritual practice, it can be meditation, prayer work, um, whatever it is, and you start really feeling great. You feel like things are, you know, down pat. Um, you're taking action in the world. Everything is coming together. It's really great. But then suddenly, um, you can't feel, you know, the divine coming through anymore. Your divine guidance seems to stop, you know, things, sort of aren't coming through anymore. You're like, what's up with that? Um, so then what you're left with is what it is, it's a spiritual test to see what you do without sort of feeling the divine or hearing the divine at that point. Um, and so it feels quite destitute, you know, um, it's sort of taken away, but it's meant to be like that, to see like what you do in the desert, so to speak. Um, it's a temporary thing. It never ends. These, these cycles are always going to cycle through. You're going to have, you know, divine things come through. They're going to be taken away. That's just how it is because there's no other way for the divine to discern like the authenticity of, you know, the work that you're putting in and also to make sure that you learn it very solidly and that it's genuine, but also to have that validated yourself as well um, to see how strong it is. Um, so yeah, you hold fast to your divine trust, no matter what it feels like or what things look like, what's coming out of your mouth at that time is the most important thing. Um, so, um, you know, that's, Yeah. We're almost at the end. I do have some more questions for you. You also have in your book these, you call it spiritual warfare maintenance? Oh, yes. Yeah, the yes. <laughs> Talk to me about them. I love some of them. The, uh, the, bath, oh. Oh, the bath sounds really, really good. <laughs> yeah. So spiritual warfare is something that I never, ever thought I would ever be encountering in my work. Um, but surprisingly, I have a, a large number of people who come to me with these things. So whether you know, they're feeling sort of a dark heaviness with them or they're waking up at the same time every night feeling weird or whatever it is. I, you know, it comes in all different forms, but I have a lot of people. But you'll also notice it's 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 nothing I put on my website or anything like that. Um, but it's definitely a very prevalent thing. Um, 
but most people don't have the spiritual discernment to tell what is going on. But once you get very used to, you know, feeling divine presence, love, you're taking action, all this stuff, you can also then begin to discern that there are other forces at work as well. Um, and you also sort of become a bit of a target just because you are ascending and purifying so much. You're getting so much closer to God and then therefore you're a threat. Um, so yeah, it takes a level of maintenance, definitely increase the prayer work, sea salt baths, um, really help, um, keep your electromagnetic field clear so you can continue to feel, um, more divinity and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, there's a whole list of things that you can do to help, uh, in spiritual warfare cases, the most effective being prayer work really, um, and really, you know, verbally invoking um, angelic assistance and protection, um, but it's it's definitely um, something that will have to be done at some point. The stronger you get, um, so so yeah, that's that in a nutshell. <laughs> I have been thinking about a prayer. When you speak of prayer, is that somehow similar to meditation? So at least in my personal work and definition, for me, prayer is transmitting to God or like whoever else, you know, angels and things like that. And meditation is receiving information, you know, because um, you have to have a level of like surrender and allowance to be able to hear or feel anything come through. Some people feel it as relaxation or peace, but really you can get a lot of information that way too. But um, but that's why um, through the process I teach, you do prayer work first to clear out any like mental interference or emotional interference. You transmit to God first, and then you're able then to um, allow divine guidance to come through and everything. And I think, at least for me, that's what meditation is because you've done the work to clear your field. So now you can receive. So I have a few more questions for you. Those are the ending questions. But before that, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? You know what? I just want to tell people, I mean, there's nothing to be afraid of. And no matter how long you have been stuck, if you can't see a way out, um, there's always a way out but you have to look up and you have to work with the divine and you have to say, you know, I want to be of service to humanity. I have no idea how it's going to work out. And even though I'm terrified, I know you're going to make a way for me and you have to be consistent every day. Um, and it will happen and just allow for it to unfold the way it's going to unfold. Um, but I promise you, you will get there. Um, and just, you know, Put your love out there and pay attention to what inspires you and you'll definitely get there. Hold on to your inspiration. How do you define success these days? What is to be successful to you? Happy, happy and <laughs> yeah. at peace. And that's it. Yep, that's it. Very clear, very simple, right? Yep. Yeah. And what was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself in life as of today? Hardest lesson to learn about myself and life. Oh, hardest lesson to learn about myself and life. Um, I guess it was back in the days when I was really suffering. I really believed I was a failure. And I guess it might not seem like, um, I guess, a hard lesson. Well, like, hard lesson. <laughs> You know what? I guess I got to say, I don't think I've had any hard lessons. It all sort of played a part to where I am now. So I feel like, you know, it it, it all just had to happen the way it, the way it did, according to, you know, the steps I was taking and what what information and knowledge I had at the time. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? I would have started much earlier. Yeah, I would have started yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. If you could change anything, if you knew you would die soon, would you make any change at all? No, I mean, yeah, the only change I would make was that, you know, I wouldn't have wasted so much time um, sort of piddling around wondering what I was going to do with my life. I probably wouldn't have even really went to college because um, I would have just pursued you know, spirituality, because that was the only consistent I really had. And I should have paid more, 
you know, I could have, we'll say, paid more attention to that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I just would have went for it sooner. No, I don't think so. I just would have went for it sooner. And then maybe I could have been doing my work, you know, 10, 10 years prior and, and yeah. been having a great time. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. waiting so long. And my last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? Um, there's nothing to be afraid of. Keep your eyes on God at all times, no matter what it looks like. And the way to peace and happiness is serving people in a way that you love. Mm -hmm. And that is it. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your energized and peaceful at the same time presence, your wisdom, your work, and everything else in between. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me so much. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Yeah, so my website is probably the best place. I do update it regularly. Um, it's uh, RebeccaRockwood.com. Um, you can also order my book there or on Amazon. Um, and yeah, any updates about me, it's going to also be on my website. Um, and I think even if you put my name in Google, I probably pop up in a few places. So, And I'll have the link also on your podcast profile. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye for now. Rebecca. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Rebecca Rockwood and her work, please visit RebeccaRockwood.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.